So let us go back to the training, and today's training is fire extinguisher awareness training. The training instructor will be Mr. Kirk Klein, the CUNY Health and Safety Manager. Please welcome Kirk. <coughs> Thanks. I'm being recorded, so that's not something I do that often. So as Shinsi said, I'm uh, Kirk Klein. I'm the health and safety manager for CUNY. I work out of uh, 80th Street. Um, this is going to now process, I guess. So, so this is for um, fire extinguisher awareness training. I know that there have been some questions um, here that Shinsi has brought to my attention about just the fire extinguisher in general, um, FDNY mandates that they're everywhere, um, they're egress. Um, I don't know what's happening here, but let's see if I can try this again here. There we go. Um, for fire extinguishers. So I know we've all seen them. They're generally red, although the water ones are silver um, and in the lab. Um, some of this information is probably going to be basic um, for the knowledge um, that this group uh, has, but um, it's still important um, regardless. Um, first thing to say is, um, and I'd like to say this, this PowerPoint is adopted from something that the FDNY sends out to use and then you sort of make it your own. Um, so some of the information in here is, is a little bit broader. We have to add more site-specific info um, to this. Um, but in general, obviously, as, since we were kids, we were tall, when there's a fire, you get out, wait to be told what to do. Right? I mean, that's the basic information. The real thing is that, um, um, now in labs it's a little different because you might actually be experiencing something, an event in your lab, and that's kind of what this is geared towards. But in general for fires or for fire safety, if, you're, if you smell smoke, right, the, the procedure is typically to call like public safety, what's going on. A lot of times that's a maintenance issue. Um, in offices, it's always burning popcorn or something like that. Um, it could be belts that are burning. There's no reason to get panicked if you just smell. Now, when you see visible smoke or fire, that's when you know something's happening, and that's when it's no longer uh, an immediate call. It's a get-out scenario. Um, and the fire extinguisher may play a role in that getting out, um, but I just wanted to be clear on that. Um, so the other thing that I always go through is, and this is something that I think we can all just try to remember. I mean, trainings, that's one of the reasons why we do these trainings, and that is, you know, I can't get this to turn off um, the timing of this, so I don't know. So anyway, the um, concern here is that if you're just working your location and you've never thought about two ways to get out, like once you leave your lab, if you go left or right, maybe you always go left, take the stairs, the elevator, go out. If you've never thought about an alternative way to go, then it's time to do that. Because if there is an incident that happens and it's your primary way is blocked off, you're going to want to have a secondary way of going out um, or even a third way. Um, fire extinguishers, you're working in an area, they tend to blend in. Sometimes they're not supposed to be, but they get used as like door stops and the like. Um, you should know where they are. Um, and then you should also know for your alarm pull stations, like those red pull stations that sometimes, most of the time are in the hallways and that. That's important because you don't have to stop the call. You can just pull one of those. It's going to alert the building. It's going to alert the fire department and, and, and go from there. Um, so for this training, we'll do just a very brief what, it, what a fire is, the classifications of fire, um, some of the leading fire causes. Um, I mean, this is all pretty basic info. Um, some fire prevention, um, what the importance of the portable fire extinguishers are, the types, how to use, and making the right decision. And I think for this group, that's really the biggest um, item that we're going to go over. Um, so this is sort of information that for this group I think is is uh, you know it's a rapid chemical reaction, um, so I think we all know what that is. Um, this is the triangle for fire for extinguishment theory: um, heat, fuel, and oxygen um, is what goes. Oh, this is so frustrating. Um, is what's going to make a fire go? Inhibiting those things. If you do the reverse, if you've ever been camping, you try to create a fire. Um, you need to create all these things or else the fire is not going to burn very well. 
Um, I spend some time in Adirondack, so I'm usually on the other side of this, trying to get more heat, um, trying to add fuel, um, and trying to increase the oxygen in there to get the fire to burn. But this triangle theory is what they use for fire extinguisher and for fire prevention, so I don't know, it'll come up. So as far as uh, classifications, and you'll see these on an extinguisher down here. Um, you had your class A, which is, um, that's like just wood, paper, plastic, rubber, cloth. That's like pretty basic um, materials that you'll find in classrooms everywhere. Um, and you'll find these in labs as well. Um, class B is when we get to more specific where you're talking about your flammable and combustible liquids and gases. Um, that's definitely what we're going to see in labs. Um, and we may even see it in some other areas on campus. Um, class C is electrical, um, which we'll also see in laboratories um, and a lot of electrical equipment and then also around campuses. And then class D are um, metals. Um, and in some cases you're working with metals um, in a lab, and this is one of the reasons why it's really important to do a hazard analysis of what's in your lab because you may have some of these things in your lab and if there's a fire and you don't have a way of putting it out and you could have stopped it, and that's what we get into later on, then there can be a bigger issue. Um, and then in K, class K if we don't know, these are big extinguishers that are found in kitchens um, and it's meant for like grease and oils and, and all that kind of thing that can take off from that. Um, some of the causes and it's all pretty standard, I think. In our case, laboratory experiments, we've had incidents of equipment overheating, and that equipment could have been either misused or it could have been um, cords that are improper, like they're damaged. Um, Staten Island, a couple years ago, had a bad fire in a lab because of a, an old heat plate stir that the cord itself was frayed and damaged and it was an older heat plate, and I'm not saying that necessarily an older heat plate definitely has to be um, replaced, but in this case the cord was clearly, that was what the FDNY determined was the cause. It was actually um, started inside a hood and then went up and got out of the hood and then caused a little bit of damage outside. The sprinklers went off, there was like extensive damage to half a lab. And it was an unattended operation, we've all done this. We turn on our stir, we go home, and you're letting something stir overnight. And in this case, most of the newer like hot plates and a lot of equipment have, have sort of some fail safes or some circuit breakers or things. This was an older one that didn't. I'm um, gonna cause the fire that way. Um, so that was both, there was some flammable liquids in there, there were other materials that were burning, and it was part electrical fire. So that was actually all ABC classifications, which most of the extinguishers you're gonna see are gonna be ABC. Um, and the slide gets into a little bit more, but um, you'll see that there. So this slide can be a little bit misleading and I talked to the FDNY about this because there's always been a big question about if you have these fire extinguishers then we're supposed to use them, right? And we're supposed to fight fires. And that is actually not what the FDNY wants you to be doing, fighting a fire. Um, they do admit that in certain circumstances you may be somewhere where a fire extinguisher would be important to have. Um, you may also be where egressing someone out. You're working in a lab, there are log lab benches, someone could be at the end near the window. They're trapped there because the fire is happening between you. You're near, the eg you're near the exit and the fire is happening between you and there. That's where they say if you want to try to use a fire extinguisher, if you've judged the situation that you're not going to get hurt, you put the fire out. Um, what the FDNY is kind of against, and it's tricky in labs because I realize not only equipment, although equipment should be insured, there are obviously things in that lab that maybe hold value that are irreplaceable, um, cell lines or, or other things. Um, they don't really comment on that too much, but the concept is they don't want people fighting a fire to save equipment or items. Um, that's like when we were kids and you're told if you hear the fire alarm, don't go looking for your wallet or keys or other personal items, just get out, because you can get killed by that um, or hurt. Um, so that's really, in a lab, it gets a little tricky, because I know people feel that they want to defend their stuff, um, which can be irreplaceable, no doubt. Um, so it, it sort of gets into this, you have a choice to make, but I, I get into that a little bit later. Um, so there are a couple different types. Um, the, the water fire extinguisher, dry chemical, and then a CO2, which you may see, 
um, and I get into some of these, but these are sort of the distances that they can handle um, and how long, if you just had it on constant, it'll work. And it's really not that long a period of time. So that type of distance and how long it would work plays into if you had to make a decision on whether you felt something was a small fire. Um, that timing worked out perfectly. Um, the other thing is, for our purposes, we have a monthly check system. OSHA actually mandates this, um, although I don't find that, I didn't find until the FDNY adopted this several years ago, as that they checked this monthly check off on this card that, we, that people were doing it. I worked at Columbia University um, previous and Cornell Medical College, um, their health science center. Um, so I've seen these a lot and we never used to check for the monthlies too much. That's been a, a recent last few years where now we do it. Essentially the monthly check is your visual check. The gauge, that's probably the first thing that people look at is the gauge, is it normal? Um, does the hose look like it's fine? Has this been damaged? Does it look old, dusty? Is the pin in? Is this here? You'd want this here because you don't want it to accidentally go off. This is just a simple plastic tie down that prevents you from spraying it. Um, you know, the, the bottom handle actually is for support. The top handle is what will cause the material to come out. Um, can this come off very well? Is it on the wall? Is it where it's supposed to be? Sometimes you see those hooks there and there's no, there isn't a fire extinguisher there. In that case, you should be contacting um, Chinsi to say, hey, I think there's a fire extinguisher supposed to be here because there's a hook. And if there isn't one, she may come in and then say, you know what, this was an old area, we don't need it anymore because it's been moved and it's fine. Um, inspection tag, like I said. There's also a tag where these have to be, every year they get checked by a company, service company. For here at this one, this is something they put on it. And then there's a life expectancy of actually the cylinder itself. Um, and that gets part of that annual check so that we don't end up with old extinguishers that are not going to um, work. And um, so that's part of the process of figuring this out. Let's see. Oops. Uh, and then this will probably go forward. So, so your water ones, which we just showed a picture of, this is pretty standard. Um, it's air pressurized water. You'll see APW. That's what that stands for. Um, the joke is that they're large squirt guns. Um, I can remember in, in a dormitory in undergrad, you know, whatever at night, late at night, and, you know, people spraying them down the hallway at, at each other. It was like a big squirt gun. I mean, it obviously was dangerous, but when you're 18 and the RA's not around, you know, you just do whatever. So, um, big thing here is that, and we won't find water extinguishers, so you'll find them in hallways a lot in buildings like this, most, especially older ones. But a flammable liquid, a water flame, would, would cause that to spread, or could cause it to spread, which would make things worse, obviously. The other thing is that electrical fire, obviously water and electricity, I'll have to get into that, but um, that's a problem there. Um, going back to the triangle, um, this extinguisher takes away the heat element. So if paper's burning, you add water to it, the heat element is going to be taken away. And it's just ordinary water that's in there. Um, your dry chemical, uh, and that's this. So you'll find them ABC, you'll find them Sometimes just Class A, although really Class A is, is that water extinguisher. Um, but you'll find them BC, and then you'll also find them in just DC um, as well. Now, for our purposes, the easiest and cheapest thing to do is just have ABC. This also makes it easier if you ever had to use it to say to yourself, if it's not some kind of a metal, flammable metal or something that's going to go, then this extinguisher is going to be fine for it. Um, now, the next one we get to is CO2. Sometimes equipment can be damaged by the fine powder that's found in these. Um, so you might have a CO2 extinguisher around. CO2 extinguishers are found a lot of times in, a, in like server rooms, computer equipment. And in some laboratories, you may see a regular extinguisher and then you may see next to it a CO2 extinguisher. Um, so, and these are very effective for putting out fire. That's why they're everywhere. And then as far as your carbon dioxide, you know, your big difference is that they don't have a gauge and instead of a, a rubber hose, it's going to be um, like a, a, a hard horn. There's a picture of it later that I can stop on. Um, 
and it's designed for class B and C only, flammable liquids and electrical sources. Um, and it's a non-flammable gas, as we know, and it, takes the, it removes the oxygen from that. So now we've seen two things that get removed from that triangle. Um, now here's where the right decision comes in. Um, knowing what fire, what's burning, can be tricky. So making a decision on putting out a fire can be a problem. Um, the first line, you're trained to use it. So the FDNY wants everyone, especially lab people, to be awareness trained. That's a requirement, to be awareness trained, and that's what you're getting here. Um, to get an actual hands-on training, it's very clear in regulations and, based, and backed by the FDNY that hands-on training, if it's not part of your job to put out fires, then they really don't feel that people need to get hands-on trained. Now, in certain circumstances, there are specific situations that may come up or may be there that, that we would want to do some kind of a hands-on training. Um, but for the most part, like we get into where if we're doing like in a construction scenario, hot work, where you're in a construction site where the sprinklers are no longer there, they're not active right now, they're going to be doing some hot work, some welding, some cutting or something, and so you have a fire guard in that and there's a fire extinguisher there. Sometimes they ask you to have a bucket of water or sand or whatever. Those people need to be trained because in that case, a fire can happen and they want to be able to put it out. There's all these regs on after you do hot work, you sit around for an hour and wait to see if there's a, you know, something comes back. Um, you know, fire, fire can spread quite rapidly. The smoke actually is more dangerous than the fire itself. I'm sure we've all heard that. Um, and if you go to fight a fire, all these things play in where your pathway to egress can become um, jeopardized if you start fighting a fire. So following your instincts. Uh, everything you read always, and it still says it, is waste paper, waste paper basket size fire, like a small fire is now what they say. But waste paper basket sort of harkens back to the days when people used to smoke indoors and they would put a cigarette into a trash can or dump out their ashes and then suddenly you'd see something smoldering. So they called it that because in that case it's semi-contained. You see it starting to go before it turns big. You get the fire extinguisher, you put it out. Um, in the case of like a laboratory or other areas, um, you know, unless you're standing right over it, you really don't know what's going on or how it started or what it involves. And so that's why they just say, get out. And if you had to get someone out, if they're blocked, then you use a fire extinguisher. Um, they just don't want you fighting any fires because you just don't know. But I've seen, when I was at Cornell Medical College, someone um, had, I, it might have even just been straight ethanol, and it was passed too close to, I think, a Bunsen burner. It lit up, they dropped it on the ground, and it was just like right here. And so when we showed up, they had already put it out. There was a little bit of singe mark on the ground. They had just grabbed the fire extinguisher because they were right there. It happened right in front of them. They knew exactly what it was, and they put it out. And so that was a case where I said that was a small fire. They judged it to be, they knew what it was. They knew how it happened, that it was contained to this particular area. They used the fire extinguisher, and then they called us. Um, in other cases, if you come in or you're just standing there and you're smelling smoke and then you look and you see smoke and you're not sure, to go get a fire extinguisher, then to go fight it, gets you into, puts you in a position that the FDNY and other fire agencies just don't want you to do that. They just don't want you to risk yourself. That's the main thing. And that's kind of the lessons that we've been learning in our life. So this pass method is for if you needed to, and this is where they do give you a little bit of training on this because they want you to know how to use one. But, um, as I said, they don't really want you to do it. So, for this, as I said, if you were to grab it, it's pretty heavy. I mean, if everyone, you know, after the training wants to come down and hold this, you can see the weight. You know, you're going to pull the pin, and it would pull, this would come off quite easily. And then you're going to just use, the, use it this way. You point it at the base of the fire, um, not at the top of the fire, at the base of the fire. Um, you're going to aim, you're going to squeeze, and then you're going to sweep the fire like this, and that's it. So if it's really small and contained, and going back to some of those charts, you only have you know, 15 to 30 seconds of material. So you really have to make sure that the fire is contained and that you're not gonna jeopardize yourself or other people by going to fight it. So for reporting, you're gonna call public safety, which is here, it's um, four twos, I think, two, 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 two. Um, uh, dialing 911, that is always an option. Um, if you call public safety, you're gonna, they're going to call 911 if there's a fire. Calling 911 if you have a cell phone and you're on a phone, you can do that as well. Um, and then 
Um, it's not recommended to stay in the building and call. You should be doing that after, once you get out. And then you try to give as much information as possible. And in the case of laboratories, that's really important um, because, you know, if they hear that it's a laboratory, Hazmat's going to come out and they're going to really do a lot of work. I can tell you that that situation at Staten Island, they always say this when there's fires, it's the water damage that becomes the bigger problem than the actual fire. They would not turn off the sprinkler heads until they knew for sure everything in that area that was burning. So basically they just let the whole sprinkler tank drain into this lab. So it wasn't just contained in that lab, it was down below and there was other damage associated with it. And they would not, no matter what, under authority of EHS, of the president of the college, would not, they would not stop it because they didn't know if it was going to flare up or not. And um, this is their big thing, you're not expected to be a firefighter, um, so you shouldn't be one. Um, unless you need to. If you're just not comfortable with it, then don't do it. Um, like I said, if there's a, like a particular circumstance that you know you're going to be working with something that you're just not sure, then we should do a hazard analysis of that. And maybe at the end of that, we would say, okay, you know, if you have a fire extinguisher around, you should have it closer and then be careful with it. And then maybe we would offer, you know, you could do, look to do an actual hands-on. Um, but in general, that's not really what um, we're trying to do. With that, so um, you know, I could just say that, like with fire safety, it's I was touching on this before. It can really just—it's one of those things that gets complacent. You forget that things can happen. They can happen in your home. They can happen in a lab. They can happen anywhere you are. So just remembering that that's the case when you go places. Look for the exits, right? If you're in your lab, just know: Hey, is there one door out of my lab? And if so. What would I do if a fire happened between me and the door? Right? Where would I go? How would I get out? If I get to the door and I always go left down the stairwell of the elevator, but yet that's where the problem is, how would I get out the other way? Um, you want to think about these things more often. Um, you know, it's just that thing of complacency. You know, my, there was an incident, and this doesn't have anything to do with the fires, but my wife was driving in the car yesterday morning at like 6 a.m., and she said she was at a light that's right near our house in Hoboken, she was the second car, it turned green, she went to go, and for whatever reason, she just didn't go right away. And a car came from the right, like 40, right through, just blew through the light as if never even saw it. And it was one of those lessons like, if you never think about driving like that, that that can happen at a light, and you never look left or right, accidents happen, people blow through them. Um, I'm sure you as a driver may have didn't see a light or, or whatever it was, and then maybe you went into an intersection. But it was just one of those things, and it reminded me that we really need to be active when we think about these things and know where we are. Make sure the fire extinguishers are there. Make sure you're aware of it and all that. Um, so that's pretty much it. If there are other questions I'm here, sir? I have many questions. Okay. given us an opportunity to think over the issue of fire extinguishers a lot again. But, um, so let me ask uh, a few things. Because first, first of all, I should say, I think that we haven't been very complacent about fire extinguishers. Our big discussions have been, how do we find out how to use fire extinguishers? Right. So you kind of gave us a general idea, but of course, like, I've never fired off a fire extinguisher except at home. So I don't know what firing a fire extinguisher is going to be like until one of my students is burning and then I'm going to, I guess I'm going to leave the building and call, sorry, no one can start this. So no, 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 it's fine. an example of <clears throat> what, should, what should people at UCLA who have a burning person in front of them done? That's my first question. Okay. Because they didn't use a fire extinguisher. No. Um, I mean, she wasn't wearing a flame retardant lab coat, and in fact, her clothing was not maybe appropriate either. Um, she wasn't, I mean, the PI might end up, I think he's going to end up answering to this, you know, because he wasn't able to show that, demonstrate that there was any training given to the student. Yeah, totally aside from that. When it's actually yeah, happening. This person burning in front of me. Right. What do I do? Right. I, I, with some, I, I'm not prepared to answer a question of a person standing in front of you that's burning and how do you handle that? And the reason is because I just don't know every situation is different. In that case, what she was working with 
right? If you knew exactly what she was working with and at the exact time of what was on fire, now I would think at that time, if it's clothing, the ABC fire extinguisher would be the place. Um, sometimes people think of the safety showers, but if it's a flammable liquid, as we learned, that might not help. So going to a fire extinguisher when you're putting someone out. It's an interesting question just to, to, to what the fire department, and I understand, see to me, I, that's a very valid question simply because um, I've never heard the fire department discuss that when it comes to what I've been talking about, um, putting out a person. I mean, you go back to stop, drop, and roll. Um, if there's a fire extinguisher available, in labs they actually used to have flame retardant blankets that they, don't, they no longer mandate and are no longer around. The original ones were asbestos, that's one of the reasons why they no longer have them. Um, even though it's dangerous, I mean asbestos is a great product for flame retardant and other uses, but, but they don't keep those around anymore. New labs just don't have them in there. Um, They did. Did they have training? They had awareness training. That was it? That was it. Would it have been better if they had had an opportunity to use a fire extinguisher before that issue came up? Or should they have left it there? I, I mean, I could just say that, like, there's no hard, fast rule on this. It's the FDNY statement via written, verbal, different people, different levels, even from their legal department. They do not want people fighting fires. And they don't say that labs are different than this. Now, they do say that some lab operations may have an increased risk. But the way they look at it is if it's a permanent laboratory, that means that they have vetted out that laboratory, that it has fire rating, that the chemicals are stored properly, that people are trained. You have your certificate of fitness, your C14, which is fire safety training. If all that's the case and they just feel that they don't want you fighting fires unless you have to. But at the bottom line is, if you ended up having that situation, you've never touched one before, that little gray area is something that they don't ever clear up. So that's why I'm trying to say that it's not a, um, a definitive. I, I wouldn't sit here and say to you that you shouldn't ever receive a hands-on training. Um, I just know that based on my experience and what they tell you, hands-on training is generally not given to people that are not fighting fires. I mean, OSHA is very clear that if you're part of an organized fire brigade, you get hands-on training. Otherwise, you get awareness training. What about the uh, construction sites that you described? Now, everybody's okay with them having some kind of equipment. Maybe it's a bucket of water, and they're supposed to now have to use a bucket of water. Aren't we kind of similar to that? I mean, we're you are. Okay, we're not welding, usually. But in a lab, if... Sure. If there's hot work going on, and even not even just a construction site, but this type of topic of hot work anywhere, there's a process of if you're welding in New York City, you need to have really oxyacetylene, but you need to have a fire guard. That's a separate person. That is a it's a certificate of fitness, just like the C14 that laboratory people go to. They learn how to do this as part of that training. They know how to work and operate a fire because. Fires happen in situations where there's a lot of material around a construction site that's flammable. And that area is not guarded against hazards like a laboratory is. Um, so as long as it's a permanent area for the fire department, um, and that could mean all new labs now have to have sprinklers. Now they're old labs. I don't know the labs here whether they have sprinklers or not. So that's the old classification where um, you have like a one hour fire rating or two hour fire rating and no sprinklers. Um, but that's you know, regulated there. So I, I know, because Chinsey's been telling me, and I think it, it was probably that was bringing this up with her, and we've had these questions from other campuses, and I wouldn't sit here and say to you that you shouldn't have a hands-on. It's just not something that is generally done, and the FDNY is clear that they don't want people fighting fires, because more people get hurt and killed trying to fight a fire than they do just getting out. Well, they have, and not just in labs, but I mean, they have them. It's not just labs, though. They're all over. But in the lab, they do want them. But if you notice, they're always placed by the egress. They want you to get out first. And then this training of a small fire or a contained fire. Actually, I had, if I can see if I can get this wording off this other area. Um, you know, some of the, like, there are rules that other, that other people train with. Um, you know, first, there are two rules, assisting any person in immediate danger to safety. Um, 
if it can be accomplished without risk to you. So in your case, if someone's on fire and you said, I can't get out if I, fight the, if I help this person, they want you to leave. It's unfortunate. I'm not telling you necessarily, I mean, that's a decision that every person would make in that spot, but they don't want you to risk yourself regardless of what's going on. And then second of all, calling basically 911 or calling, you know, activating the alarm. Um, and then, you know, keeping things in mind. And this, I'm just going to read straight off of this because I thought this was really good and it's something that I would adopt maybe into this training. But, you know, like I said, knowing what's burning, even if you have an ABC fire extinguisher, there might be something in the fire that is going to explode or produce toxic fumes. Fumes are another area here that people aren't aware of, especially in the lab. You think that it's just a small fire or it's this, but the fumes itself can overwhelm you. And not just the smoke itself, but fumes that are coming off of something that's burning. Um, I mean, chances are you, you might have an idea. If you're in an office that's connected to your lab and you walk in and something's happening, you definitely don't know exactly what's going on. But if you're standing over it, like those people did with ethanol, they knew exactly what was happening. It hit, and the way it was described, because I actually investigated, was that they passed it over, it was in their hand burning, and they just, they had the sense to say, not to just go like this and drop it on the bench, they literally turned and it was at the end of two benches where there's a bigger open area, and kind of just, like let it fall so that if it spread, it would spread in an area that they felt like they could handle it. There was a second person that while this was happening was going at the fire extinguisher. So they knew exactly what was happening. Um, that's really my only example of someone that I can think of that has fought a fire in a laboratory in that way. Um, well, part of the irony of this is, I mean, I admit I'm not trained as a firefighter, but I am trained as a chemist. Right. I know a lot about toxic fumes that are given off by the chemicals I work with, even if they're somewhat obscure, I've got some specialized training about it, and that's true of almost everybody in this room. Uh, and if anybody's going to be aware of what kind of chemical reactions are likely to happen, you'd think it would be us. But we're the ones who aren't, allowed, aren't supposed to make these kinds of judgments, but construction workers and security officers are supposed to make those judgments. That's another part about this that I don't well, really understand. security officers themselves aren't necessarily given hands-on training either. And it's not necessarily part of their job to put out fires. That's my next question. Thank you. That's a perfect lead-in. Why do we have fire extinguishers? They, they mandate them. We're supposed to know where they're located if we're not supposed to use them. Why is the it's not that you're not supposed to use them, but they don't want people fighting fires. Because what you just described describes what the way what was going through my mind when you were just describing that you're the chemist, and that is all very true, and that knowledge is very important. But at the same time, fires spread so fast and rapid, and there's so many incidents out there of people that have gotten killed by not responding immediately by leaving. So if you take five seconds to start thinking about, well, wait, what's there? I have that chemical on the shelf, then that was there, and why did it start as an electrical? That can already be too late time. That's perfectly understandable, and I think that's, that makes a lot of good sense. And now you've explained it to us. Right. And therefore, we're going to be able to follow this excellent advice. But in those weird situations where using a fire extinguisher is the right thing to do, isn't it better for us to have training in doing it and that's, to just say, don't have any training, and that's better? That's actually well, this, because it will prevent you from using and a, and aware, one second. In an awareness training, this is the training that everyone is supposed to receive. That's enough in their mind that in an emergency, if you felt like you could use a fire extinguisher, you could do it. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't pick one up and see the weight and see if you could do it? Um, do you physically have to you know, release these. I, I know that in places where when that yearly, the year check is coming along and this has gotten, for whatever reason, it needs to be recharged, there can be still material there. In some cases, those are used as that. Or if the company's going to take it out because it's out of the year and it needs to be replaced, sometimes those are used. And I hate to say it, it's not really a money issue, although it is if you had to do training with every single person for hands-on, that is part of the, the factor here. Obviously, and I'm not saying that's coming from CUNY. I'm saying that's just as an industry standard. There are training things out there now where it's digital, um, 
where you literally like, it's the same weight, same look, same everything, and it's a digital screen that you put out of fire. What I was going to say was, when you look at construction sites and hot work, it's an official program. So those people, when you're doing it, if you're going to do work here, you come into an area, you look, are there smoke detectors, duct detectors, where am I working? You're not allowed to have combustible materials within a certain distance of these things. So you do all this work ahead of time to prepare the site. You can't have floor openings, wall openings, where a spark can go into the next room. Even though that's all the case and you prepare all that, you still are with oxycetylene required to have a fire guard around. And that fire guard sits around. Now in the laboratory scenario, as I was saying, if there's a specific thing that you do or are planning to do, where you think that there's a heightened problem where you might want to have right there, and I don't know if that's the case or not, I think that's a perfectly valid situation to say, I feel like I should have a training because I may use it. Because I think a small fire could break out Right, maybe, and so I would want to use it. And I don't have a problem with that. And then if we wanted to do something like that, we can work on it, we can talk to Chinsey about it and so and send something. It, for something specific that you're, you know, for your, for your situation? I mean, I, I would not say no to it.